I was looking at your, your motion and I just wanted to ask a few questions about it. Um, so could you just tell me a little mm -hmm. bit about this motion and why it's important? What I'm going to be doing is putting forth to the uh, Municipal Council a motion asking um, the regularization of non-status people who live uh, in Montreal. And the reason why I'm doing this is because, first of all, in the borough of the Racing Michel Park Extension, there are several people who are non-status who live here. Their situation is already precarious. With COVID, it's just gotten worse. And now with the curfew, it's just, it's made things very, very difficult, particularly for them. Uh, it's something that I've always uh, defended in, in terms of uh, asking for a status. I think it's something that we should do. They all live here. And as non-status, they don't have access to any of the government programs. So they have to work to be able to, uh, you know, feed and house their families or themselves. And so knowing that they are working, well, I believe that it's the uh, morally, ethically, and now politically, it's what we have to do is give them the status. It's unacceptable to know that we have people who are living here, are our neighbors, are working, and don't have access to all the same services, even though they are contributing to the community in general. So um, since you, you are the mayor and, and you do reside in, uh, in Park X, do you kind of, do you notice these negative effects um, that, that migrants have not being status and, and trying to ex access status? Do you notice these negative effects in their daily lives? Well, I know because I've spoken to them, they speak out to me, uh, just in terms of at so many levels, it has an impact, right? I mean, first of all, on their health, um, physical or mental. And, uh, and that's, I would say, the, the most noticeable, if not the first impact. And then we notice just in terms of like very basic things, if I can, you know, when people want to cross the street, I mean, I was, um, I would say, uh, a jaywalker with, you know, like, <laughs> I, it just never occurred to me that, you know, it's like, oh, well, there's, you know, I want to cross the street, I cross the street wherever, whenever. Um, and I really started noticing, obviously, as mayor, I have to make sure that, you know, I curb my <laughs> jaywalking. Um, and I do. And then I noticed like so many people here in Park X really, really, really respect the signs. And I don't think that it's just because of all, uh, hopefully it's all the messaging, but I don't think it's just the messaging. I think that people really have understood that your best interest is just to make sure that if there's a stop, you stop. There's a red light uh, and it's very tricky. I don't know if you've been to Park X, but the uh, lights are very tricky at specific intersections, notably the one at Hutchison and Ogilvy in front of the, the metro. Um, you know, a red light is when pedestrians cross, which is completely counterintuitive. And, um, and so I've noticed people really respect the, the all the all the signs and it somehow stems from that amongst other things okay um would you maybe say this is one of the uh i guess maybe more minor examples of migrant people constantly being in fear of deportation that's a minor example but i have known so many people who have been arrested because of that so um, people who suffer, you know, with um, the stress 
and all of what the stress, you know, because of their situation causes, we don't see them. Unless somebody comes to you and shares their story, you don't necessarily know A, what their status is or what their struggles are. And so it's just when something happens, you know, like somebody gets hurt at work, uh, somebody, you know, something happens at home or that they need to access the medical services that red lights start going on. So, and again, I'm not sure that the general population even knows this, right? Um, but in terms of in Park X, notably, just the fact of not respecting the signs, it's, it's a minor, like, you know, it's a minor infraction other than the ticket, but for them, it changes their life. And it's happened, and in Montreal, it's what has been used. This is the easiest way to, uh, you know, open the door to deportation. And, um, and so it's a minor thing in our everyday lives, but for them, it just exacerbates their, uh, you know, the, the level, it's just an example, actually, it's a small minor example of what actually, um, the amount of like vigilance that they need to have. So, I mean, I have heard a story of somebody was crossing the street and the line was, the light was turning orange. And by the time she crossed over, it was red and she got stopped. And this is a true story, got stopped got ticketed, and then immediately it was found out that she had a deportation order and she was sent to a detention center. And so, and we do this every single day. Like, do you ever, you know, stop and think the consequence of like running through a yellow, like you don't. But they, and she, and she had, you know, she shared the story with me and she had the intuition of like, uh, you know, but she said the person in front of me crossed. So I just, you know, joined in with the other person. You know, so they, so even crossing the street becomes an issue. So everything has to be, um, nothing can be second guessing. Everything has to be calculated and Everything ha and they're like everything is. The, they lead normal lives. They are our neighbors. We don't know necessarily who they are. But everything for them becomes a huge challenge. And so it's uh, okay if I don't call you within so much time, then an action plan has to be put in. Um, here are, you know, you have to, you know, make sure that they have keys in case when they come home that they see, you know, policemen around because sometimes it may be because the police are there to pick them up or it's just a random, you know, so again, how I, I mean, I've had stories of people saying that we didn't leave our apartment. We stopped making all noise so that we were not, uh, it sounded as if the apartment was empty because uh, there were, you know, police all over the building. And in essence, it was because a neighbor had been dead and like, and so they had a unrelated issue. But, you know, they, and, um, and so it just creates an amount of stress and they did not move till all the cops were gone. And it had nothing to do with them, but they had no way of knowing it, and nor did they want to even ask out of fear. And and so this is where, um, again, we would just open the door, you know, when the knock would have come, and it's like, yeah, hey, what's up, you know, don't know anything, ciao, bye, that's the end of it. That's not how it happens for them. So the, uh, and, and so, and there are, and so these are all minor details. So this is what I'm saying, you know, everything is, you know, there's always has to be another plan. So if they come home and they see cops, well, they have to be able to turn around 
and go somewhere else. They need a safe space. So all of these mechanisms have to be there. Everything has to be thought of. Um, you know, they, they need to save their money. Should something happen, they need a backup plan because they know that they will not be getting like now with COVID, they don't have access to any resources. So they need to have like money saved up to pay for rent, to be able to, you know, all the costs. Um, so, and obviously when they work again, you know, the, the amount of abuse that they have to, I, they put up with because A, they don't necessarily always know what the recourses are. And even if they do know what the recourses are, um, there's always that, you know, uh, danger where they think that they will be deported so that they just keep on, you know, um, putting up with it till it just gets so bad that they can't live with the situation. Really um, reminds me how privileged I am hearing all this, honestly. We all are. <laughs> Seriously. Um, so going back to, to what you were mentioning about the cops, have you noticed that, uh, you know, more intensified policing um, due to curfews, are, due, pardon me, due to curfew, uh, is this making migrant people, you know, more parano paranoid of deportation? I have to admit, I have not left my house <laughs> or, or I made sure that I was at home for eight o'clock. So I cannot at all, you know, attest to what's going on after. But what I do know, uh, because again, people have shared their stories with me, is that because of curfew, um, some people either don't have a letter from their employer because they are working under the table. So no employer wants to actually say, <laughs> I'm employing somebody and not through legal channels. So many don't have those papers right off the bat. So they can justify being out on the road after eight o'clock or before five. So what that has created as a situation is that people are going either to their workplace and being there before, getting there before eight. And so people, you know, like shifts normally end at around, you know, 11, 11.30, midnight. Those are like, you know, when you have the turnaround. And so what happens is that people get to their workplace before the curfew and sleep or nap on the job in a either lunch rooms, storage rooms. Uh, so either with the lights on or the lights off, but in a storage room, that's not exactly what you would call, you know, the most adequate um, place to sleep. And so it's created again, you know, like they have to, you know, in, be inventive in terms of the, uh, the solutions. Um, I heard another story where a gentleman um, went, normally would get picked up at the subway station, I don't know, I don't remember, let's say 10 o'clock, so that his colleague could, you know, they were cold, um, going to work to or car sharing, right? So now that's not an option. So he goes to his colleague's house before curfew. And now it creates a situation where normally you're not supposed to go to somebody else's house if you're not in the same bubble. So that's the first situation. So already there's an infraction if you want. Then the coworker has to put up with, you know, having, you know, it's a coworker is a coworker. Do you necessarily want your coworker to be in your house for a couple of hours? Like you want to accommodate somebody, but do you necessarily want to do this all the time? Does the person necessarily know the status of his coworker? Like, I mean, it, it just generates a whole bunch of other things. So um, he was going to tough it out as long as his co-worker would accept the situation. But he is pretty sure that the co-worker will eventually say, you know what? And then he's going to lose his job. So this is the kind of things that I've heard. Thank you so much for sharing. 
Um, so last week, the immigrant workers. Sorry, and if I can add, and if they do have papers, like, you know, if they do actually have an employer's letter, well, they fear that it's not enough. But if they do get stopped, well, then it's going to be, well, okay, well, give me, you know, your driver's license, license, Medicare card, or something else with your picture and name so that we can actually. So it just creates an enormous amount of stress. Um, so I actually don't know this, but but do, do do migrants, do they usually have some form of documentation or it's usually like documentation from their country of no, origin? No. Okay. No. Okay, so that's no. very complicated in these situations. Yeah. Um, so last week, the, the Immigrant Workers Center, they put out this press release, um, similar to kind of what you're demanding for, uh, for regularization, but also for um, police to stop demanding identification when they're, uh, you know, looking at uh, letters from employers in terms of curfew. Um, and Mustafa, Mustafa from the IWC, he was saying that um, he doesn't want uh, police to continue to collaborate with the Canadian border agencies in terms of, you know, when they see an undocumented person yeah. and they report them. Um, is, this, is this something that you're seeing and, and what are your feelings on this situation? I, I totally agree. I, I think that it's two different services that should not be collaborating. Um, and um, each service should be able to do their own job, right? And uh, what I have been told is that when people, and this is relatively new, maybe a couple of years, but it wasn't always the case, but from what I've been told is when people arrive in Canada and ask for refugee status, they get an immigration document. And on the document immediately is tagged on a deportation order. Now, maybe you wanna verify this, but this is what I have been told. And the reason being is that if you are refused your refugee status, normally you're supposed to leave, right? You ask status, we refuse it, you leave. And so people, many people don't leave. And so by tagging on immediately the deportation order, And not before it was like a, another step, right? Whereas now it's in your document. So this is why for the SPVM, if I'm not mistaken, it's easier for them to right away know that there's a deport deportation order because it's already there. So the what is considered breaking the law in this case is the fact that you did not leave the territory. And I'm not an immigration lawyer, I'm not an expert, I'm just going from, and I'm going beyond as mayor here, but, um, and that's what the problem is. So it's considered a crime not to have left the territory if you were asked to do it. And I would say this is a personal comment, but uh, they're still working here. And if they're still working here, that means that we need them. So not leaving the territory, I would not deem it as the highest of all crimes and needing a deportation order. The same way you would treat somebody, you know, who maybe should have them. Like there's no scale. Mm -hmm. And everybody gets treated that way and you get treated as a criminal. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, hmm, okay. So I know this is a bit more asking for statistics, but, but maybe do you have a feeling or kind of an estimate of how many migrants are in our workforce or if not an estimate, do you think that they contribute a lot to Montreal society? I'll give you a number, but I don't know if you've had that number and if somebody else gave you the same number, I, I cannot verify it nor vouch for it. I heard 50,000. That's the number I've heard. 
um, but I don't know if it's valid or not, but I do suspect. I wouldn't be surprised if that were correct. Um, that being said, it's undeniable. The uh, positive impact that they are all having on our community. Clearly, they are not stealing anybody's job. I would say nobody wants to do the jobs that they are doing. And they are clearly contributing to the economy. And if we had to have, you know, um, some kind of migrant worker strike, the same way they've had, you know, in the US, I think it was in California, I don't know where, the, a day without a Mexican. If we had to have a day without a non-status person, I mean, you know, food processing plants would stop. Um, you know, we would not have our fresh vegetables on our, you know, on our dishes um, and households and offices would not be cleaned. We underestimate the amount of people who are here and the contribution they're actually having. Very true, yeah. It's, it's always really unfortunate to hear that narrative of, oh, they're stealing our jobs. <laughs> I think people who say that are really misinformed. Yeah, completely, completely. I don't, I mean, um, and what they have to do to like make ends meet, right? So it's, um, and you know, like those, especially meat processing plants, it's very often if they're non-status, there are people who have recently arrived who have, you know, very precarious status. Um, not many people want to be in those jobs. And um, I have people who have gone through the whole process, you know, like because they were in between statuses and, you know, and who've had to go through all of that. Um, they all the same, same narrative, you know, we did it because we needed to send money back to our family. I needed it because I had no other financial support. Um, and many somehow had the hope of being able to graduate from those jobs and move on to others and Others being, you know, like going from the meat processing plant to a cleaner's job. Uh, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, it's, there's statuses within the work offers. Um, and I guess, you know, uh, but it boils down also to what your personal skills are, your contacts are. Um, so I know people who have been in the same job for like eight years, whereas others were able through, because of the language, you know, like if you arrive today and tomorrow you're working, well, you will not be able to learn either French or English. And if everybody who's around you is in the same situation, well, chances are you will not learn French or English or just the basic gists of it. Um... And so others through, you know, because they actually, you know, have been able to find networks, have been able to learn the languages, have been able to like, you know, maybe get onto better, better paying jobs. But it's, you know, they always remain very precarious. Okay, thank you. Um, and how will granting uh, these people status, how will it prevent them from being exploited in the workforce? Well, I, first of all, they would be able to just get like, you know, minimum wage. <laughs> That's a, a first. Uh, they'll actually be able to um, 
access to services, you know, just simple stuff like, you know, the norms de travail, you know, just having access to the basic, um, hopefully, you know, just basic, um, minimal work related rights. That's already beginning, minimum wage. Uh, just getting that load off, like just getting the stress off the shoulders is just going to be like, it's an immense weight. It's an immense weight that they're carrying around, knowing that they can actually access, you know, health services. So, and I just think it's a win-win for everyone when you know that your neighbors are, you know, just, you know, when you struggle, but you know that we're all in it together, it makes a difference. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, so when, um, when will this motion go to vote? A next borough council, a next uh, city council. So that means, um, February, either Monday or Tuesday, so the 22nd or the 23rd of uh, February. Okay, perfect. Um, I guess, how are you feeling ahead of the vote? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm feeling actually very positive. I mean, I've spoken to the different labor unions, so the, uh, you know, uh, the CSN and the FTQ, both the presidents have given me, of the Conseil Central and the, um, of the FTQ uh, and of the CSN have given me their um, their support. Uh, there is, I mean, I'm I'm just one of many, right? I mean, there's a whole coalition, there are whole groups, everybody. So I'm just one more, uh, not joining the bandwagon because I've always been there, supporting in different ways. I. For me, ultimately, it's always been the organization of all people with non-status. Maybe this is why I have been less vocal around just uh, the um, more about, you know, with related to the um, people who were, were working in the health sector uh, during COVID. Doesn't mean I don't support it. I just think that it's so much bigger. Um, and so this is why also it's not necessarily easy to have everybody on board because not everybody, I think everybody wants regularization for everyone. It's just in terms of strategy, I think that's where people don't necessarily agree on the strategies. Do we go step by step? Do we ask for everything? Uh, knowing that we have a provincial government that's very, um, that, uh doesn't see eye to eye on this topic um in terms of the municipal government and and the provincial government how do you feel their support or lack of support has been towards um migrants especially during the pandemic well i'll speak on like more the municipal level in in terms of municipal level, it's not like immigration has nothing to do with the min with municipal politics. So in a sense, this is why I've sort of taken a step back because from day one, I mean, it's an issue that I know is on my agenda, but, um, but we don't have powers. Now it's not because we don't have powers that we can't talk about it and that we cannot use the power of our voice, the power of all the city council members to say something has to happen. Um, and what we can do is certainly, according to me, minimally, minimally is give them a status within the city of Montreal uh, and something that doesn't um, create a two, <laughs> like, you know, two kinds of citizenships, right? And so this is where I have to be very careful with the way I word it and what I tell you, but we don't want, you know, having an ID card for one person who's non-status and another ID card for me who has, you know, who's born here and has all the rights. So we don't want a, like a two, two kind of, you know, 
two tier system or something where, so this is where I think people are very hesitant um, because we don't want to create that. We just want to make sure that if the, we create a Montreal identity, you know, ID card or something, everybody has it because you're just simply living on the territory. Great. And, and this would be used, for example, like um, non-status people, if they're stopped by police and they ask for ID along with their letter, they wouldn't kind of have that worry because they would have this Montreal ID card. Well, I'm taking long term, right? Like if okay. we don't, if we cannot uh, get regularization, well, then, you know, can we at least get some kind of identity? So if you, me or anybody else wants to go to a library, wants to get stopped, you know, instead of taking out your Medicare card or getting out your uh, uh, license, driver's license, while well, you take out this card. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you for explaining that. Um, hmm. So. But well, that's one idea. Huh? Yeah, exactly. Um, I know that you touched on this a little bit, but uh, if, if this passes, you know, what are the next steps, I guess, maybe what needs to be to be done first to uphold this motion? Well, next step is uh, having the, you know, I, I believe it's, we have to put pressures on the provincial government. They do have powers. Um, I believe the, there is opening with regards to the federal government, but then everybody, you know, just says, you know, federal does, uh, you know, is not moving, but it's not moving because of the provincial, provincial is not moving, but, and just throwing you know responsibility back and forth, but I do believe that a lot of responsibility does lie um, at the provincial level. If there really was um, a recognition by the provincial level, then it would things would move. Uh, with the government we have, we have uh, the weight of Montreal is very. It's not a huge weight that we hold, seeing that we only have elected one person on the island of Montreal. Um, so because of COVID, because of the curfew, maybe pressures will start coming to the provincial government by their own CAC MPs, hopefully, or by business people outside of the island of Montreal who are saying, okay, well, you know, like we're feeling this pitch. Like it's, it, it has to also come outside of Montreal. Okay. Um, and typically what, what is applying pressure? What, what does this consist of? Well, I think we have to be vocal about it. It has to be, we have to speak out about it the same way we did it for the homeless people you know, and pressure was put, you know, it's unacceptable in, you know, uh, 2021, uh, but you have, you know, people who are living on the streets in a society that is, you know, so full of wealth, it's unacceptable. So the same way that people are talking out about it, uh, trying to figure out how to, you know, maybe not resolve the systemic side of it, but, you know, putting, you know, um, measures and, you know, they lifted the curfew for the homeless. You know, we've put up tents. We have, for example, in the borough, uh, we have, um, uh, we've opened with other partners, um, a shelter in a building, so with social workers and, you know, beds, food and whatnot, everything there for the homeless who live in the borough. So we have put things. Well, I think the same way we do that for the homeless, we have to do it for the non-stats. Um, I'm, I'm backtracking a lot with this question, but in, in terms of regularization, um, wh what does this look like? Like, how, how does this roll out? What do you mean? Um, like in, in terms of, I guess, like regularization and, and providing status to people, is it, I guess, is it more like a, a expedited process of what they're already going through to try and get status? Ah, the way I see it, and correct me if I'm like just going up the wrong track, but 
what I'm thinking, and it's already it has already been done in the past, um, but it's just uh, an amnesty. The same way, for example, they've done it with people from Syria, right? They, so it's not the same, it's two different scenarios, but the people who came in from Syria, like everything was just fast tracked. So there are ways to fast track. And we have had several cases, well, not several, but some cases of people receiving amnesty. And so like groups of people. And so I think amnesty is a possibility. So that means everybody who's on the territory you know, magic wand. I like to dream, but I think that uh, we need to be hopeful. We need to be a little, um, I believe in the magic wand because if I didn't, I wouldn't be, you know, sitting next to you or facing you. I, we need to have that hope um, and faith in, Maybe it's naive, but I think that being too realistic is somehow not always, you need to be realistic, but it's not enough. Because if not, you can go forward because there are so many hurdles, even at my level, uh, so much, um, so many obstacles that you need to be somehow guided by something else. Okay, thank you. Um, so would this typically be in the same order of, of getting, you know, like a residency in Montreal and then like kind of like it leading up to, to you know, Canadian citizenship? There are different strategies. So uh, like ideally you want them, I, ideally we want an amnesty. Like, I mean, that would just, that's like, you know, just makes everybody's life easier. And it's like the simplest thing. I think that giving a Montreal citizenship is just, um, it's a step if nothing else can happen. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking all this time to speak with no, me. No, and thank you for the interest and um, all the supporting. Uh, I think that uh, budding uh, journalists, I think it's important to support. Thank you. Thank you so much. It really means a lot to me. Um, best of luck with everything. Hope the rest Thank of the you. week is not too hectic. <laughs> All right. Take bye care. Bye. All the best.